everyone, and welcome to the Global Primatology Virtual Conference hosted by Central Washington University. I'm Kelsey Strong, and I will be moderating the session today. This session is with Dr. Lara Abandano and will last until 2.30. Before we start, I want to let everyone know that this session um, is set to be recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, feel free to turn off your cameras. Additionally, we want to make this a fun learning experience for everyone involved, so we request um, a few that we, everyone follows a few session rules. So one mic, one voice, uh, only one person speaks at a time. Respect all identities. This includes pronouns, nationalities, ethnic, ethnic groups, etc. Uh, we want to make this a safe space, so don't feel discouraged. All are welcome to engage and ask questions. Any disruptful or disrespectful behavior will result in termination from this session. Um, and in this session, we are going to have questions at the end. Feel free to send me them during the chat, um, during the presentation if you want, or again, save them. And I will do my best to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask their question. Um, so with that being said, we will go ahead and start recording. And I will introduce you to Dr. Lara Abandano. Lara is a Colombian primatologist that works with Adeline of Primates of Colombia and Ecuador. She recently completed her PhD exploring the reproductive behavior of wild lowland woolly monkeys at the University of Texas, Austin, and is currently teaching at Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, and her pronouns are she, her, and hers. With that, I will turn that turn it over to Laura. Thank you very much, Kelsey, for, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. So. Please let me know again if you can see my screen. Um, I cannot see anyone, so if someone can say, yes, we can see your screen, that would be awesome. Yep, we yep. can see it. Awesome, <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah, again, thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone that's here. And I first wanna thank uh, Ashton and cent everyone at Central Washington University for this great opportunity, for the invitation. And what I'm gonna be doing today is talking to you about uh, most of my findings of my dissertation research on reproductive strategies of woolly monkeys from Amazonian Ecuador. So before I begin, uh, I would like to say that in respect of other Spanish speaking scholars, which I've seen on the participants list that there's a few over here. And given that my work was in a Spanish speaking country, I have included a brief translation. Oh, sorry. I don't know why that happened. Uh, I've included a translated summary. Uh, entonces, en la parte superior pueden encontrar los puntos más importantes de cada diapositiva y esto es importante porque hay que recordarle al mundo que, que la ciencia también se habla en español. Veo que también hay algunos eh, portugueses, o oh, no portugueses, brasileros acá. Eh, quisiera extender esto al portuñol, pero por ahora solo tengo eh, traducciones al, al español. Also, um, before uh, I start giving, uh, showing my presentation, I would like to say that this work, what I'm going to be presenting to you today, is part of a long-term project on woolly monkeys uh, that I've been conducting um, over the last six-ish years, along with my former advisor uh, of my PhD, Dr. Anthony Di Fiore, also with Dr. Z Tony Ziegler at the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center, and with Dr. Kelsey Ellis, who is now a professor at Miami University, but also happens to be um, an alumni of Central Washington uh, University. So for all of those uh, from Central right now, um, just to know that there's a primatologist out there working with bullies that is a former alumni. Okay, so for today's talk, I would like to focus on some of the major findings for my doctoral dissertation research. So first, I would like to talk about reproductive endocrinology of female woolies and focusing on three things, the sexual behaviors in relation to female fertility in adult females. Also, uh, a behavior that is usually not seen, not as common in primates or other mammals uh, that is exploring intrasexual competition among female woolly monkeys. 
and also looking at the ovarian hormones of subital females prior to them dispersing from their natal groups. And then also showing about the looking at the reproductive patterns in relation to the mating patterns that we observed in the field. This was done with genetic analyses. So basically, I want to present the results on male reproductive skew um, and how it relates to potential sperm competition, consortships, and group stability, and also some of uh, some cues that we got that there might be secondary dispersal among adult females. Okay, so to begin with uh, the presentation, um, we know that among most primate species, females are observed engaging in engaging in sexual behaviors during both fertile and non-fertile periods. Uh, however, what we see is that behavioral observations are not always reliable indicators of female fertility. Uh, I am sorry, I don't know why my slides are jumping, um, but. This is why endocrine data is necessary to assess sexual behaviors in relation to female fertility. So when we look at uh, female reproductive endocrinology uh, among primates, platyrines in general, what we see is that specifically, specifically for adelines, it has been uh, well studied. Uh, so we see that there has been studies on howler monkeys, spider monkeys, uh, and murikis. However, woolly monkeys so far before the, my dissertation was the only genus uh, of the adelines where female reproductive hormones hadn't been studied yet. So just to give you uh, everyone a little overview of woolly monkey and compared to other adelines, uh, their reproductive strategies, what we see is that unlike howler monkeys, we see that woolly monkeys, spider monkeys, and mirakees are characterized by having uh, or by living in large multi-male, multi-female groups, where males, both males and females, mate with multiple partners of the opposite sex. And males of the same social group, what's interesting is that they do not seem to engage in overt contest competition over mating opportunities. And also what we see is that females have very long interbirth intervals, approximately three years, uh, making it very difficult to study their reproductive patterns, given that it takes so long for females to reproduce. And this is why it's important to keep in mind that even though this is considered like a long-term study to some extent, uh, it's really a short time period given these long interbirth intervals, especially when you're studying something uh, like reproductive patterns. And what's interesting about spiders, woolies, and murikis is that in all three genera, we see that they're characterized by being male phylopatric. So what we see is that males stay in their natal groups, while females are the ones that disperse to other groups, potentially to find unrelated males to mate with. And it has been suggested that this lack of overt contest competition for mates uh, between males is due to this precisely to this male phylopatric nature, where basically you see that males uh, might be avoiding uh, agonistic interactions to maintain strong social bonds with their male relatives, which may be important uh, in the context of uh, cooperation during agonistic uh, interactions against predators or perhaps during intergroup encounters with neighboring groups. Now, among woolly monkeys and murikis specifically, what we see is that males are also tolerant to other males in mating contexts, where you see usually you can usually see copulations occurring within view of other males, and where males basically never fight over uh, mating opportunities. Instead, what we see is that males may be competing with one another uh, via like for fertilizations indirectly, perhaps by engaging in sperm competition. Uh, which in murikis and in woolies, this sperm competition or the idea of sperm competition is consistent with some anatomical features. For example, uh, both genera have very large testes relative to their body size. And what we see is that also, at least in woolly monkeys, we see that the penis, for example, has this trumpet shape, which could potentially be used to remove sperm from other males. Um, uh, and that, again, gives us an indication that perhaps sperm competition might be occurring in this general. Also, uh, among murikis and also in woolly monkeys, what we see 
is that sometimes there is the presence of a sperm plug, which is often visible uh, on the female, female's outer genitalia after the male ejaculates. Again, all of these uh, observations are consistent with sperm competition in both murikis and in woolly monkeys. In contrast, what we see with spider monkeys, different to murikis and woolies, is that they often mate in seclusion in these contexts of consortships where usually a male and a female pair move away from the others in the social group to co copulate exclusively with one another. And actually in, in spider monkeys, uh, there is evidence of some lethal male-male agonistic interactions in the context of reproductive competition. So as we can see, woolly monkeys and murikis are much more tolerant in mating contexts when we compare it with spider monkeys, for example. However, in general, what we see among adelines is that female choice has been suggested to play an important role in their reproductive patterns. For example, both spider monkeys and woolly monkeys, uh, in both in these species, we see that females are characterized by having proceptive behaviors, uh, such as the one that we observe here in the video. Here we see a female teeth chattering towards a male, and right after we see the male mounting uh, the female, and we also see other types of solicitations. For example, females present their genital area or their genital region to the male, and then this is followed by copulations, or even there's cases of manual stimulation of the male's genitals by the females that again is usually followed by a copulation. Also, it's interesting that unlike many catarine primates, catarines and many other platyrines in general, uh, or platyrines in general, do not have sexual swellings or other conspicuous visual signs uh, that advertise female fertility, which to some extent may allow females to choose preferred males when they're fertile and then mate with other males when they're non-conceptive or outside that fertility window. Now, when we look at woolly monkeys specifically, which was uh, my study taxa, we see that unlike woolly, unlike spider monkeys and murikis, woolly monkeys typically have one or two males in each group that are conspicuously larger than the other males in the group. These larger males are more noticeable or are noticeable because of their larger body size and their exaggerate, exaggerated secondary sexual characteristics. Not only their large body size, but also they have larger testes. They have like larger facial muscles, like the temporalis muscles are much bigger, the jowls are much bigger. Um, but even though we see that there's usually one or two males that is bigger than the other ones, what's interesting is that these males are not notably dominant over other males. And although females solicit and mate with multiple males in the group, preliminary genetic results, and we're gonna see later uh, more uh, consistent results or a, a bigger picture of these results, what we see is that genetic results suggest that reproductive success is actually skewed towards the larger males, even though females are mating with all males in the group. Also, interestingly, woolly monkeys are different from other adelines like spider monkeys and murikis in that they display sexual dimorphism, which when combined with the results of male reproductive skew, may suggest that to some extent, females might be choosing to mate with these larger individuals or that perhaps uh, maybe the larger testes of these bigger individuals make them better uh, competitor competitors in the context of sperm competition. Also, not all females solicit and mate, uh, not only females solicit and mate with nearly all males in their groups, but they have also been observed mating with extra group males. And also one thing that is really interesting in woolly monkeys is that approximately previous data has suggested that approximately 20% of the copulations are harassed and interrupted by other females, suggesting that females may actually be competing for potentially preferred males, again, in the context of female choice. However, the lack of endocrine and complete genetic studies that we've seen in woolly monkeys make it difficult to assess whether females have preferred males 
uh, that they are choosing to mate with when they are fertile and perhaps other less preferred males that they're choosing to mate with during less fertile phases of the ovarian cycle. So basically what we wanted to do with uh, this dissertation or our research was to establish whether females, uh, whether female mating prefers, preferences are reflected during fertile and non-fertile phases of their ovarian cycle. So the main goal of the research, as I was mentioning, was to characterize the reproductive strategies of these wild woolly monkeys in relation to female fertility. So to address this question, I tackled this from different approaches. So from the endocrinological approach, uh, the behavioral approach, and the genetic approach. And throughout the presentation, I'm gonna show you the different results that we see when we combine all of these different approaches. Okay, but to give you an overview of how this study was conducted, um, this was done at the Tiputini Biodiversity Station, which is a research site uh, in the middle of the Amazon uh, rainforest in Ecuador. And this place is really cool because it's one of the most biodiverse places in the world. It hosts uh, 10 primate species and an intact predator community including jaguars, pumas, birds of, of prey, like the ornate hawk eagle or the harpy eagles, showing that again, that uh, predation can be a potential issue for woolly monkey survival. So basically we've been studying uh, four groups of woolly monkeys at the Tiputini Biodiversity Station approximately since 2014, we've been collecting behavioral data. Um, and even though there are approximately eight groups at the field side or in the trail system, we have focused on groups C, D, G, and P. These groups are characterized uh, by having like discrepant or differences in, uh, in their group size. So we have two groups, C, D, C, and D, that are considered to be small, usually with 15 to 20 individuals in that group. And then G and P are larger groups with approximately 30 to 35 individuals. So what we did is that we collected endocrine and uh, behavioral data. So for endocrine data, we collected fecal samples. For behavioral data, we collected uh, behavioral observations in the context of focal animal sampling. And this was done specifically in two different mating seasons. So in the 2016 to 2017 mating season, which unfortunately, unfortunately due to issues with my visa, I had to return to the US. So uh, the mating season or the observations are short and I had to cut it before the end of that mating season. Uh, but then I was there for the 2017 to the 2018 mating season between August and February. Okay. So the first step to answer these questions was to assess whether females were engaging in sexual behaviors with different males during the fertile and the non-fertile periods. So to do this, I had to conduct endocrine analyses to assess uh, female hormone profiles and identify ovulation events that marked periods of high fertility, which I assessed as three days before and after an estimated day of ovulation, as well to identify periods of low fertility, so outside that fertility window. Just to give you a quick overview of how this is done, uh, so to create these individual hormone profiles, what it did was to extract steroid hormones by mixing the fecal samples collected in the field in an alcohol solution that was thoroughly mixed, and then that separated, and then is put into these SP cartridges, where basically hormone hormones bind into these cartridges, and then those are taken to the US or, or were brought to the US to do the endocrine analyses. Those were done at the Wisconsin, Wisconsin National Primate Research Center, where I conducted enzyme immunoassays on progesterone and estrogen metabolites, and I assessed uh, an ovulation based on sustained uh, fecal PDG uh, with two standard deviations about baseline levels, followed by a rise in estrogen metabolites. And here I have this short clip because for anyone that has conducted any sort of uh, these hormone assays or genetic data in the lab, they know how important a good playlist is to get you through this very monotonous work. So this is basically what got me going when I was doing these 
analysis in the lab. Okay, so let's jump into the results. So basically what I got is that for each day that I collected a fecal sample, I had a progesterone and estrogen concentration that then we mapped together and it allowed me to see these changes in hormone concentrations over time. From other studies done in platyrrhine primates, we know that when ovarian hormones rise, that is an indication of ovulation. And then when that rise is sustained over time, it actually represents conception or the onset of pregnancy. So we could assess not only when females were ovulating in their ovarian cycle, but also when they became pregnant um, to assess behaviors before and after pregnancy or before and during pregnancy, sorry. Okay, so after identifying these ovulation events and creating individual hormone profiles for each adult female, then the next step was to map sexual behaviors in relation to periods of high fertility and low fertility in these cycling females, and then determine whether females were engaging in sexual behaviors with some males with when more fertile, and then maybe with other males when the chances of becoming pregnant were much lower. So the behaviors that we looked, uh, the sexual behaviors that we were uh, recording were female to male solicitations, like the one that is here and that I showed you before, copulations. And also we looked at male to female inspections uh, where males usually sniff or lick the female's genital genitals or their urine. And this may provide chemical cues of fertility for the males. Finally, we also looked at female genital scent marking behaviors where females rub their genitals against the substrate like a branch, potentially leaving a chemical signal for others to detect and which could potentially be informing males about the female's fertility status. So to figure out potential female preferences for specific males, we also looked at whether females chose to solicit or copulate with males of a specific age category. So whether they were adults or subadults or with a specific body size, whether the male was the big adult male in the group or whether it was a regular adult male in the group. Okay, so let's dive into the results. In this graph, what we see is that the red areas are representing periods of high fertility around the time of ovulation and each point represents the proportion of focal samples that at each uh, that each sexual behavior was observed among, across cycling females. And what we can see in general is that there is no apparent relationship between fertility and the proportion of sexual behaviors that we observed. And when we conducted binomial regression models, what we found is that none of the sexual behaviors observed were predicted by the female's fertility status when they were cycling. Also, females did not seem to be choosing to mate with males of a particular body size or age category during periods of high fertility compared to periods of low fertility. Now, when we move away just from the specific periovulatory periods and we look into broader categories of female fertility, so before they're pregnant, and here shown in blue, and after conceiving in red, what we see is that females were observed engaging in all types of sexual behaviors. So, uh, anogenital rubbing, solicitations, inspections, and copulations, both before and after conception, meaning that they were still sexually active uh, even during pregnancy. However, we did find that females were more likely to solicit and copulate with adult compared to subadult males before they were concepted or before conceiving than during pregnancy. And one really interesting behavior that we observed is that it was only non-adult males, so only juveniles or subadults who were observed inspecting females once they became pregnant, right? Uh, well, what we saw is that none of the adult males inspected females once they were pregnant. So what this suggests is that mating patterns in woolly monkeys may actually be the result of both female preferences for adult males and perhaps a better ability of adult males to assess female fertility before and after conception, such that they inspect and copulate indiscriminately throughout the female's ovarian cycle uh, while still conceptive, but they might lose interest 
in engaging in these sexual behaviors once the females have become pregnant. Again, I was also interested in looking at whether females were choosing large males uh, when they were more fertile or not. And in general, what we saw is that they did not engage in sexual behaviors more frequently with these large adult males uh, than with other adult males. So there seemed to be no preferences towards particular males um, throughout the ovarian cycle or before and after becoming pregnant. So in summary, what we see is that sexual behaviors are not limited to when females are conceptive and females may engage in these sexual behaviors with large and small adult males, as well as with subadults uh, during fertile and not non-fertile phases of the ovarian cycle, as well as during pregnancy. And this non-conceptive mating may actually be a strategy of female woolies to confuse paternity among several males and perhaps increase the chances of them receiving benefits from these males, such as, for example, increased protection against predators and conspecifics, or perhaps a higher tolerance during social interactions in feeding contexts, which can be, for example, sharing feeding uh, resources both with the female and the offspring. In fact, male interactions with infants are not uncommon in woolly monkeys, and what we often see is that males uh, are carrying, inspecting, playing, or handling young infants. However, it is still unclear whether these male infant interactions that we observe are the result of females uh, of a female strategy to confuse paternity or whether they re reflect kin relationships. For example, here in this video, what we see uh, is that an adult male, his name is Cusco, is carrying Cotopaxi, the infant, for a few seconds. And then what we saw when we were doing genetic analyses is that Cusco is indeed Cotopaxi's dad. So these affiliative interactions could potentially be representing parent offspring relationships, uh, but it could also be the case that the female, the mom of Cotopaxi was successful at confusing paternity, not only with Cusco, but with other males in the group. Uh, and that is why Cusco is being affiliative or tolerant to this infant, not necessarily be because Cusco knows that that is his infant, but because he thinks it might be because of that paternity confusion uh, strategy of the females. Uh, it may also be the case that males are affiliated with young infants to strengthen bonds with the infant's mother, which could potentially increase future mating opportunities with that female. But this is something that uh, we're hoping to continue collecting data to be able to kind of tease apart uh, what is the function of these male interactions in woolly monkeys. Now, another interesting behavior that I was telling you uh, at the beginning and that we paid close attention to was female harassment and interruptions of copulations like the one that we see in this video. We can see at the top a male that is copulating with a female and then uh, we see that the male is constantly pushing away the female on the bottom, which keeps interrupting or harassing this copulation. We often see these behaviors as the females kind of like soliciting the male while the male is copulating with another female. Or like in this case, we see this female kind of like touching constantly the male's back or the male's head up to the point where we see that the male usually breaks the copulation to chase away the harassing female and again, if the copulation is broken, then the chances of ejaculation are much lower. So again, as I mentioned earlier, this may be a form of female-female competition among woolly monkeys. This female-female competition, uh, like when I was trying to come up with uh, hypotheses of why it may be happening, uh, I was hypothesizing or predicting that it may be due to the sperm uh, depletion hypothesis that states that if sperm competition is important, as we saw that it might be for woolly monkeys, then females would be expected to harass copulations that involve preferred males to pre prevent sperm depletion of those males, and especially when the female harasser is likely to become pregnant. So when the female harasser is on the fertility peak. Therefore, we looked at these relationships between female harassment and the periods of high and low fertility 
uh, in both the female that was harassing the copulation and also the female that was being harassed. Similar to previous findings, we saw that approximately 20% of all observed copulations were harassed by adult or, or subadult females. But interestingly, all except one of the interrupted populations occurred when the female harasser, so the one that was interrupting, was uh, non conceptive. So this suggests that it may necessarily not be a strategy to avoid sperm depletion of males. Given that anyway, the female that was harassing the copulation was in a period of low fertility, so the chances of becoming pregnant were very low. Instead, what we see is that approximately half of those females that were harassed, those females that were actually copulating and being harassed, those were actually in, um, in their peak fertility window, right? So 50% of the harassed populations happened to females that were actually uh, likely to become pregnant. So what we see is that maybe harassment in woolly monkeys may be a strategy to prevent other females, not the harasser, but the harassed females from getting pregnant rather than competing for male sperm. And by doing so, females can potentially reduce future competition for resources or for male services given that it may increase the likelihood of males directing future attention to the harasser female and their offspring. Uh, basically, if males have less chances of being the dads of more infants uh, of the females in that group, maybe that male would pay more attention to the female that was the harasser initially if she has a, an offspring with that specific male. Okay, so that was uh, kind of like a rush through the results that I obtained on uh, adult females and the relationship between their ovarian cycle and their sexual behaviors. Now let's move on to some interesting behaviors that we found on subadult females prior to their dispersal. What we know is that ovarian, um, sorry, sex bias dispersal is a mechanism to avoid inbreeding uh, among kin. And in male, many male phylopatric species, what we see is that rep reproductive maturity doesn't happen until females have dispersed into new groups where they can actually find males to mate that are unrelated. Among the Adeline primates, for example, what we see is that uh, females are characterized by being the ones that disperse outside of their natal groups. And what we see in both spider monkeys and in murikis is that these subadult females tend to disperse before they begin to display any sort of sexual behaviors or show any evidence of ovarian cycling. In woolly monkeys, however, the picture is a little bit different. What we see or previous reports have uh, shown that females have been observed displaying sexual behaviors and copulating with co-resident males prior to them dispersing outside their natal groups. However, it is still unclear because there were no endocrine uh, studies done before uh, the study. It was still unclear whether females start ovulating before or after emigration. So what we wanted to do was investigate this relationship between subadult female ovarian uh, hormones and their sexual behaviors uh, prior to them dispersing from their natal groups. So to do this during the 2016 and 2017 mating seasons that I was telling you about before, we followed a subadult female in each mating season. So in group G, we had Gabby, who was a subadult female who we were able to follow approximately four months before she dispersed from her natal group G. And then in the 2017 mating season, we have Cuenca, uh, and we were able to follow her just about 1.5 months before uh, she dispersed outside her natal group. So what we saw were that the results were kind of different for each subadult female. In the case of Gabby, what we saw is that the hormone profiles indicated that the first confident estimate of ovulation was just four days prior to her disappearance of her natal group, which is presumably when she dispersed from this group which is very interesting because it's around the, not the exact same time, but it was just a few days prior to that increase in hormones, 
when we saw her first copulating and displaying teeth chattering behaviors and also seeing males inspecting her genital region. Uh, so again, it is interesting to see this matching of increases in ovarian hormone profiles as well as sexual behaviors right before her disappearance, which again is presumably when she dispersed from her natal group. Unlike Gabby, however, what we saw in the other subital female in Cuenca was that she did show an increase in ovarian hormones right before her dispersal, but this rise uh, was not as conspicuous or as evident. It did not meet the criteria that we had for assessing it as an estimated ovulation. However, we see that the hormones did start rising prior to her dispersal, approximately nine days before she was no longer seen with her natal group. However, with Cuenca, what we saw is that there were no sexual behaviors observed before she emigrated from her natal group. So, even though our sample size is just two subital females, which is very small, what we see is that the increases in ovarian hormones in these two subital females right before them emigrating from their natal groups may be actually an indication of the onset of puberty prior to or very close to their dispersal potentially to seek new social groups and potential mates. Additionally, something that was extremely interesting for me was the genetic and demographic evidence suggests that female woolies may actually be able to conceive soon after dispersing from their natal groups, which again is very different to what we see in spider monkeys and in mirakees. This is a particular case of a different female, not Gabby or Cuenca, but a different female who was initially followed as a subadult female in group P in October of 2015, but then in 2016, she was observed ranging with group G. And then in September of 2016, this female actually gave birth to an infant who then with genetic studies was confirmed to have been sired by a resident male in group G, so the group that she dispersed to. And considering that in this population of woolies, the gestation period is approximately seven months, this female probably conceived with the male in group G sometime around February of 2016, which is just a few months after she was seen, last seen ranging with her natal group P. So what we see is that uh, it is likely that female woolly monkeys reach sexual maturity and become conceptive soon after dispersing from their natal groups, which again is very different to what we see in other adelines uh, like murakees, that is the sister taxa of woolly monkeys, or also spider monkeys, where we see that subadult females tend to disperse before they begin to display any sexual behaviors or show any evidence of ovarian cycling. And these differences between woolly monkeys compared to other adelines may be explained by the fact that home ranges of woolly monkey social groups overlap substantially. Uh, basically, there is, uh, if you can see in the map, these home ranges are overlapping a lot between the different social groups. And therefore, they have a lot of intergroup encounters, much more uh, than, for example, what we see in murikis or in spider monkeys. And also what's really interesting is that not all of these intergroup encounters are aggressive, not all of them are agonistic, and actually about 60% of these intergroup encounters are either considered to be neutral, where the groups like come close to each other but don't necessarily fight or interact much, but also they uh, we have seen intergroup encounters that are affiliative, where you can see individuals from two different groups ranging together, sometimes even foraging in the same uh, feeding tree. Additionally, it's not uncommon to observe males send marking during intergroup encounters, like in this video that we have here, where a male is doing this chest rubbing behavior during an intergroup encounter. So it is possible that subadult females are being exposed to the chemical signals of extra group males which may actually help trigger the onset of puberty before the females emigrate from their natal groups. This is similar to uh, what we were listening, uh, Dr. Jacinta Beener telling us yesterday, I think it was yesterday uh, at the conference, uh, where similar observations have been recorded in ball gelatas where females were found to be three times more likely to mature after exposed to a non-resident male in the context of a male takeover 
And therefore, what we see is that social conditions, such as the exposure of novel males, may trigger the process of sexual maturation in subadult females. So, in conclusion, for the subadult females, what we see is that it is likely that a high degree of home range overlap and the frequent intergroup encounters. I'm sorry again, I don't know why my computer is doing that. The frequent inter uh, encounters between animals of neighboring groups may expose predispersal females uh, that are subadults to chemical signals from novel extra group males, again, which may induce the onset of puberty before they emigrate from their natal groups. So again, really interesting to see uh, how these subadult females and adult females, their sexual behaviors to some extent are uh, correlated or not to their ovarian hormones. Okay, so the last part that I wanna talk to you about, uh, there was another chunk of my dissertation, uh, was the relationship between paternity and male reproductive skew. And for this, what I did was that I used copulation data on identified adults, uh, adult and subadult males, and this data did extend those 2016 and 2017 uh, mating seasons. This is part of the long-term data set for woolly monkeys that we have been collecting at Tiputini since behavioral data since 2014, and then genetic samples since 2013. And what we did is that we did parentage analyses from fecal samples using 10 polymorphic microsatellite markers. And as you can tell, my dissertation is very related to poop samples. Okay, so what did we find uh, based on these genetic testing? Overall, what we found is that in groups C, G, and P, so these ones here marked in red, where there was a presence of these large adult male in the group, we see that it's these large adult males, the ones that are seemingly to be siring the majority of the offspring in these groups. As we can see here, those are shown with these black arrows. And we can see that, for example, Chromio, Gary and Gipmunk, and Finn are siring uh, a large majority of the infants in those groups compared to the other males uh, that are resident to those groups. One other thing that we found that was really interesting is that when we compared these paternity data with the copulations that we recorded in behavioral observations, we see that these are not necessarily matching. Um, what we see is that even though females are mating uh, both with adult, regular adult males and the large adult males, basically uh, at a similar rate, what we see is that these large adult males are siring a higher proportion of the infants in their uh, resident groups. And this discrepancy between what we see uh, in mating and reproductive patterns may, as I mentioned earlier, may be explained by potential sperm competition, which is consistent with their large testes and phenol morphology in the woolly monkeys, especially if you consider what I was telling you earlier, that these large adult males have conspicuously larger testes than the other males. So what we see is that male competition for reproduction might be happening not in an agonistic way, but at a post copulatory level in order to perhaps maintain those social ties between other male relatives. Remember that these males are, or these groups are male phallopatric. So this might be important for cooperative behaviors during agonistic interactions against predators or conspecifics, for example, in the context of intergroup encounters. Uh, or a predation event. Uh, however, there is there might be another explanation, and it might be that during behavioral observations, uh, females and males were engaging in these consortship behaviors similar to spider monkeys. It was actually not uncommon to see a male and a female move kind of a little bit away from the rest of the group and or from the rest of their social group as they were moving. And sometimes they started copulating uh, for a few minutes or a few hours, just the two of them, before they returned to the rest of the social group. So it might be the case that behaviors, sexual behaviors like copulation may have been missed by observers, which again is why we see that uh, there is this discrepancy between the mating behaviors and 
the paternity skew that we see towards these large adult males in the group. Again, what we see in woolly monkeys is that females sneak out and engage in these extra group populations with males from neighboring groups. This was very common to see, especially among some specific females. And something that was really cool to see is that when we looked at our genetic analyses, this was suggesting that there might be um, secondary dispersal among females. This is the case of a female that was initially called Gisela and then Dinamita, where in between 20, 2008 and 2012, uh, and this we know based on um, the infants that Gisela um, or that other associated with Gisela, she had two infants with males in group G where she was first observed in 2014. So in 2014, she was ranging with group G and then genetic analyses say that between these time periods, she had two infants with males in group G. However, in 2017, that same female was observed in group D. Initially, we didn't know it was the same female. That's why we called her Dinamita, but then genetic analyses showed us that it was actually the same female. And in 2017, she was observed with a newborn, no more than a month old, uh, suggesting that potentially the, the newborn was very small to collect any genetic uh, or fecal samples, but she was ranging with group D, suggesting that potentially this newborn was sired by a male in group D. So as we can see here, this female was ranging with group G initially, had infants with or reproduced with male, males in group G, and then moved to group D and potentially uh, had an infant with a sire in group, in group G. So given that there is this high spatial overlap and these frequent tolerant intergroup encounters in woolly monkeys, it might actually be possible that females might be engaging in these extra group copulations, potentially to increase the chances of finding male allies in neighboring groups in the potential case of a secondary transfer, like we saw in the case of Gisela and Dinamita. So if they have these male allies in the neighboring groups, they perhaps are more likely to be incorporated or accepted uh, by other members in that other social group. Now, if you remember, I was telling you this about large adult males versus other adult males in groups G, C, and P, but what do we see in group D? In group D, it, we see a very different pattern because interestingly, this was the only group where there was no conspicuously large male. Uh, and interestingly, it was the only uh, group in the population where male reproductive skew was lower. And instead, what we see is that paternities were more equally distributed among several males in the group, like we see in the graph here, there is not a single male that is siring a majority of the offspring, like we see in group C, G, and P. Additionally, group, P, group D, sorry, is interesting because this group has been characterized by showing signs of instability in male residency, where it was not unusual to, for example, see unfamiliar males ranging with the group for short periods of time, or sometimes resident males would disappear for several months up to, I think, almost a year uh, before they were seen again moving with that group. So again, males, male residency were, was more unstable than what we see in the other groups where there is a presence of a large adult male. So what this suggests is that perhaps group stability may also influence reproductive success in woolly monkeys. Okay, so just to do a quick recap and conclude about the major findings of this research, what we see is that non-conceptive mating may allow is frequent in woolly monkeys and may allow females to confuse paternity and potentially receive benefits from multiple males in their social groups. However, males may be able to detect chemical cues of female fertility which may hinder those females' attempts to confuse paternity. Also, one really interesting thing that we found was that females may compete to prevent other female pregnancies, again, perhaps to avoid future competition for resources. 
And in the context of subadult females, what we see is that exposure to chemical signals from novel extra group males during these intergroup encounters and by scent marking behaviors may actually induce the onset of puberty before, before females emigrate from their natal groups. And when we're looking at the male reproductive uh, patterns, what we find is that potentially sperm competition, consortships, and group stability may be factors that play an important role in the reproductive patterns of woolly monkeys. And extra group copulations may benefit females in the potential case of secondary transfers. Okay, before I finish, uh, I first want to acknowledge and thank uh, the indigenous communities that have been living at these places, which are the Wawarani and Quechua uh, communities who have actually been the protectors and guardians of these forests for many, many years, and who are the ones that have resisted uh, against oil exploitation and the destruction of the Amazon for rainforest in this region. And if we think about this, it is only thanks to these protectors and guardians that I and other researchers at this field site had the immense privilege of living in one of the most beautiful places on Earth, and studying one of the most fascinating species of primates, which for me, of course, is the woolly monkeys. Um, so thank you very much to all these, uh, these indigenous communities who have resisted and are still resisting uh, this invasive and uh, oil exploitation activities that are still happening today in the Amazon rainforest. I would also uh, like to thank uh, all the people that were to some extent involved in this research, field assistants, staff members at the uh, field station, all the funding agencies, and also uh, my collaborators. Um, so thank you very much for being part of this, of this process and of this research that has been going on for several years now. And thank you very much for watching this talk and please do not, oh, sorry, please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a pretty amazing presentation. I'm not going to lie. Um, so we will go ahead and start with the question portion of this session. There are a few um, questions in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself to ask the question yourself, you're more than welcome. Um, you can do that a couple of ways. So if you just under participants kind of hover over your name, there's a raise hand feature that will allow me to um, do like an unmute request. Um, that same feature is under reactions at the bottom of your screen where it just says raise hand. Um, so to start us off, um, I want to just to kind of give you a a map of where you were when this question was asked. Um, you were going over the results of the sexual behaviors in relation to female fertility. When Kenton asked, um, do you take in, um, do you take family ties into account? Family ties into account of? Um, I'm assuming with like the female fertility, he did a follow up question of, and if a female already has a baby, does this lead to particular behaviors? So, like, if I guess how. And Kenton, you might have to unmute yourself to clarify if I get this wrong, but I'm assuming like how kin relations and. Um, are affecting sexual behavior mm -hmm. and also how females are changing their behavior if they already have an infant. Yeah, so. Um... This was not something in particular that we were looking into, like whether or not something that I analyzed for my dissertation. It would be really interesting to see if there are differences, whether like, for example, females are primiparous or uh, sorry, nulliparous or multiparous. Um, one of the main reasons we didn't do this is because we only had one female that was uh, potentially nulliparous, all, uh, all other females. Um, had another juvenile or infant, not infant, uh, but another juvenile associated to them. Um, so again, like we didn't really look into this that much. And when we look at uh, kin relationships, this is something that that I didn't show in the in the talk. But we also looked at whether, for example, uh, females were 
engaging more often uh, in these sexual behaviors with male rel relatives versus not. Uh, there didn't seem to be like a, a conspicuous trend, but one really interesting result that we found in group P is that, uh, I don't know if you remember from the graph, but like in group P, Finn was the large adult male that sired most of the offspring. Basically, all of the kids in group P were sired by Finn, except the kids that were uh, associated with one specific female. And our genetic analyses indicate that that female that did not reproduce with Finn actually is the mom of Finn, which is really interesting to see again that there is inbreeding avoidance, right? Like happening because it is very likely or it, yeah, it is very likely that males residing in these groups because of this male phylopatric nature, they are residing in groups with their moms, right? Uh, and again, even though it wasn't, we had the suspicion that males would, uh, or that the, they would be um, avoiding inbreeding through sexual, by avoiding sexual behaviors with uh, their related mothers or females. Uh, it was really cool to see that these genetic results show that even though this male sired basically all the kids in group P, it was just the ones that were associated with that female that were the ones that were not sired by Finn. I don't know why Finn is so successful, to be honest. Um, it's it's a conundrum, but that was really interesting. I don't know if I answered the question, though. Um, um, all right. And then um, also in the chat, Mariana says, thank you for the excellent presentation. I would like to know if you observed any case of infanticide after females harassment. That is a great question because to my knowledge, and maybe it, it's something that I usually put in other presentation and I should put it today. To my knowledge, there are no reported cases of infanticide of woolly monkeys in the wild. If someone here has seen a, an infanticide uh, attempt or a case in woolly monkeys, please, please, please contact me because I've looked everywhere and there are no reported cases. And again, I, there was no case, no apparent attempt of infanticide uh, by the females or the males in these social groups. Usually we, what we see in these female harassment situations, it's, I don't like to equate it to like male-male agonistic competition because you don't see like females going and fighting very aggressively with each other. Again, what we see in these interruptions are, it's like very subtle uh, and it's like the female being like, hey, 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 touching the male, soliciting while they're, he's still copulating with another female up to the point, like, and this is very anthropomorphizing, but it's like, it's like the male gets tired of that other female and chases her away. Kind of like in a sense of like, leave me alone. Stop bothering me. Um, but we, like, we haven't seen like these very agonistic, uh, in like interactions or aggressive behaviors between females in the context of female harassment. It's more like these subtle behaviors uh, that again, it even though it's not an aggressive interaction, it might still be indicating female female competition for for reproduction. Um, I'm curious, do you think that maybe because there are no cases of infanticide, it's maybe a result of the fact that the males stay in their natal group and the females leaving causes almost like a genetic mix up where like you might be moving into a group of females that you might be like related to on some level. And so like, if you're a male staying, you're not gonna kill off any infants in that group because they're probably yours. And if you're a female moving into a new group, you're probably not going to kill off any infants in that group because there's maybe a small chance that it's like a distant cousin. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and again, what I was mentioning, the fact that um, females, I mean, maybe I didn't stress it enough, but like females engage in extra group copulations all the time. There was this specific case uh, for those that I see, there's some here that have followed these woolies. Callie, for example, was a female in group C that would disappear it disappeared for like almost two weeks from group C and I didn't see her at all. It kind of sucked because I was like, I really need a fecal sample from this female. 
and couldn't find her. And then when we finally found her, she was ranging and moving with group G, populating with those males. Um, so again, like by the fact that these females might be like transferring to these other groups or copulating with neighboring groups, uh, it's not only the resident males that are discouraged from attempting infanticide, but also males from neighboring groups. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that that might be one of one of the cases. And in general, what we see, I think we kind of expect because of like other studies on uh, catarine primates mostly, we expect like species or males to be very aggressive, attempt infanticide, and we kind of like take that as a default, uh, right? But in this case, what we see is that in general, I call I, I call the woolies, and I think other researchers also call the mirakees, like the hippies of the forest, in the sense that they're super tolerant to one another. Like I was telling you, sometimes it was like it was really annoying as an observer that you're like, oh, I'm following group G, and then all of a sudden you see another individual from group P foraging in the same tree. You no longer know which group you're with. And it's because they have like these very tolerant interactions that perhaps perhaps are less common than what we see uh, in other groups. Um, and again, because of these very high degree of home range overlap, there's like this sense that they're not like specific individual separate groups, but they are kind of like all of them kind of intermixed to some extent, uh, not necessarily reproductively, although we see that to some extent it happens, but also like sharing the same resources and moving and foraging together, uh, being tolerant to one another within and between groups. Very cool. Um, if there are no new questions, I'm going to go ahead and ask another question that Kenton had. Um, you were discussing ovarian hormones in the sub-adult females when they asked, have you ever observed a female who conceived a child before its dispersal and who would be born into her new group after dispersal? No, um, we, and again, because woolly monkeys take so long to reproduce, like we, even though like I'm telling you like these patterns, it's it's very little data that we have, and we we have not seen a subadult female um, kind of like having a kid, uh, or like we did see like this subadult female that I was mentioning that she was copulating and displaying sexual behaviors. She those sexual behaviors were displayed with a resident male of her natal group. Uh, it was an unrelated male. Um, and the the issue as well is that once the females disperse, we kind of lose track of them, right? Uh, because we don't know other groups that they're going to, uh, except in these few cases where genetic we have genetic data that we can tell, like, oh, actually, this female that we watched in this group is now in this other group. Um, but there is no indication that these subadult females are reproducing with males from their natal groups. But I always say, ask, ask me in five years and probably we'll have more data, more solid data about that. All right. Um, Kenton, I'm loving your questions, by the way. Um, so yeah, we'll keep going. So Kenton has another one that says, what can push a female to leave her group after dispersal, of course? For example, if she's been living in a group for six months, and one day decides to change, like what pushes her, what motivates her to leave that that group, the group that she originally immigrated into. Again, because we like we don't have, we haven't been able to, and that's, I mean, that is a question that I would love to answer. I would love to put radio collars on all subtle females to have an idea of where they are dispersing to. Unfortunately, we actually had one case where we had a radio collar on Cuenca. Uh, like the subadult female that we followed in 2017. And we were lucky in the sense that we kind of tracked her the day that she was dispersing, which I think it's like a very unusual case. And she, she dispersed two kilometers north of the farthest point of the trail system up to the point like for us, like we would have to like set a different camp in that area. 
uh, which I don't even know at that point if it was still the limits of the of the field station or not. Um, but we saw her ranging like very up north in a very different group. And again, like uh, we tried following her, finding her again, and then we lost track of her. So we don't know. That's another really cool thing that would be interesting to see, right? Like our subadult females that are dispersing, like do they move into a new group and then they stay? Or perhaps they scout into different groups before they actually like settle into a new group. Again, we followed this female. She was with this group. When we tried to find her again, she was no longer with that uh, group or we couldn't find her. We don't know if she lost her color or if she perhaps moved into a different group. And again, because the cases of subadult females dispersing into different groups is really hard to track. Uh, like, I don't have an, an answer for what motivates females to stay in, like, into a new group or not. Uh, it would be interesting to, and again, most, most studies or most of the behavioral observations that we've recorded have been on adult individuals. Uh, but it will be interesting to see as we start accumulating more data on subadults, on recently um, immigrant females. Uh, perhaps how long this they stay, if they move into new groups, uh, what are the social interactions? One of the things that we see though is that they they kind of like stick to some specific, like with some immigrant females, they kind of like stick to some uh particular females and they start being like more affiliative. But again, like it is sometimes really hard to to track these new immigrant females that sometimes stay for just a few days or sometimes they stay for good. Um that that would be a really interesting study, follow up study for sure. Kenton just said, super interesting. I'll keep your email and we'll come to you to ask the question in five years. <laughs> yes, please. Um, we have a new question from Tommy. What are interactions like between woolly monkeys and spider monkeys at your field site? Do they share home ranges with each other at all? At all? They do, they do share home ranges. And just to give you guys a little bit of, of background, I started following spider monkeys in Colombia. And then before I worked with woolly monkeys at Tiputini, I was actually a, a field assistant for the spider monkey project. I used to hate woolly monkeys with my heart because spider monkeys move in much smaller groups. Uh, as you might know, they have this fission fusion uh, grouping patterns. So they move in much smaller groups. And sometimes I was with spider monkeys and then the woolly monkeys would come. And then like I would lose my spider monkeys and I was like, ah, woolly monkeys, I hate you. Now I love them. But they do overlap their home ranges a lot. And the interactions, I would say it really depends on the group composition of both the woolly monkey subgroup and the spider monkey subgroup at the time that they interact. Usually I will say that, and I don't know, like just because I haven't really looked at percentages or stuff, but like just from top of my head, what I remember is that when they came together, uh, if there was an adult male with the spider monkeys, they used to, they tended to displace the woolly monkeys. But when it was just the female spider monkeys, because woolly monkeys usually move uh, in larger subgroup sizes, right? More individuals. What you would usually see is that female spider monkeys would be displaced by uh, woolly monkeys in a feeding tree. Sometimes if when, you know, like in the most productive uh, times of the year, you would sometimes see them foraging in the same tree. There were times, as I mentioned, Tiputini has 10 primate species. There were times that we would observe up to, I don't remember, six or seven primate species plus macaws, plus, you know, in these very large fig trees that uh, were fruiting a lot. Uh, but yeah, when there were like smaller fruit fruiting trees, um, it really depended on the group subgroup composition of uh, woolies and spiders on who would be displaced. Very cool. Um, where you kind of started off with spiders and then switched to woolies, I mean, do you have a favorite? And then also a two-parter on that is, is there a species that you like would just love to, to study that you haven't already? So I always, tell people that spider monkeys are kind of like my first love and people say like, oh, you never forget your first love or whatever. And it's like spider monkeys have a very special place in my heart for sure. They are the species that got me into primatology, right? 
But if we look at the literature, there's been a lot that has been done with spider monkeys. We know a lot about spider monkeys. If you look uh, about, like, if you do a Google search or a web of science search on woolly monkeys, there's very, very little. And that kind of like scarcity of data is kind of like what got me more and more interested in the woolies. The more I started reading on them, as you saw in the presentation, it's like, oh, you're you're kind of defying all the things that I learned in my undergrad in biology about sexual selection and males competing for females and then females being passive and like waiting for males to, you know, like uh, court the females. And here I was like, wait, the females are the ones that are like doing the first moves and then the females are the ones that are competing. And I just thought that woolly monkeys were fascinating, that there is very little that we know from them. Uh, and I will say, like, I do want to continue uh, studying the woolly monkeys because, again, there's very, very little information that we know from them. And I think we still have so much more to learn from from their behavior in general that can inform us a lot about, like, uh, the adelines and platyrines and primates in general by looking at these diversity of behaviors. We tend to focus or in primatology, there is like a very big bias towards, and I apologize for any catarhinologist in this <laughs> session today, but like there is a big skew towards apes and macaques and baboons in general. And I think the more that we diversify into the different species that we work with, uh, the, by doing so, we get a better understanding of what behaviors and the biology of primates is as a whole without like basing our understanding of primates just on a few species that we know a lot from. Yeah, I think I recently just came across an article that basically looked into what you just said and and they basically did like a meta-analysis mm -hmm. of all of the research articles and the, the species that you just listed were like the yeah. top. Um, all right, does anyone else have any questions they want to ask? You can either unmute yourself or put them in the chat. All right, I have a few. Um, I always like to hear like for you, probably like what's the best and worst part of field work? In general? Yeah. Like the best is, I mean, the monkeys. It's where I always say that Field work for me is like uh, entering in a meditative state, right? Like uh, for me, there's no better therapy than being in the field. Um, you know, like you're in, I don't know, it sounds, I don't know, but it's like you're in tune with nature and then you're just observing the monkeys. Uh, you're also, at least in the research that we did, uh, we were by ourselves most of the time. Um, so it really lets you focus a lot on the monkeys behaviors but a lot into like what is around you right like when you when the monkeys are sleeping for two to three hours uh you start seeing a lot of things in the forest uh interactions between plants plants and animals between different animal species that otherwise you would not be able to see maybe if you're with a different person that you're chatting with all the time uh so that for me i i just love being in the field and like observing these um interactions that i would otherwise wouldn't see also in the middle of the amazon rainforest basically you see a different a new species every day whether it's an insect or a plant or whatever it is uh there's always something new and i would say the the worst part i mean i don't know to be honest the mosquitoes maybe um Mosquitoes can be quite annoying sometimes. Sweat. I know a lot of people hate sweat bees. I don't have that much of a hate relationship with sweat bees. Like, I'm okay with them. Uh, but yeah, sometimes that and like the weird tropical diseases that you sometimes get in the field that you don't know how to get rid of. I was very lucky um, that at the field side where I worked, uh, like most of the staff members um, were Kichwa or Waurani, so they knew a lot about the forest. Uh, so they knew a lot of medicinal plants. So for example, 
several times I got uh, this parasite that it's called lar larva migrants. That if I believe it's a nematode that like kind of crawls into your skin and starts like burrowing into your skin. Sounds awful, but mo more than anything is just super itchy. Uh, and if you look online, it's always like take antibiotic, blah, 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 blah. You're like these really harsh uh, kind of solutions. And uh, the staff members at the station were like, no, just crush these leaves and put it onto your skin for a couple of days and it'll go away. And while I was like, oh, yeah, it burns my skin a little bit, but it goes away. So, so yeah, sometimes like the tropical diseases are kind of scary. Um, but yeah, I was, I was lucky again that uh, I had really good staff members to take care of me and other researchers, not only in terms of amazing food, but also in first aid kit from the forest. All right, and then Kenton just gave us another question. Have you ever had a big fright? Do you find yourself facing a monkey or another animal, for example? Yes, so not another monkey, to be honest. Uh, the All the primates that I worked with, and in general, like we see that most flattering primates like are arboreal, right? And they do come to the ground, but at least at Tiputini, they like woolly monkeys rarely come to the ground other than the clumsy ones that fall and then they try to run up back to the tree. Uh, so I've never had like a scary interaction uh, with the woolies or the spiders. Um, the scariest slash most or one of my most exciting moments in the field was uh, an interaction that I had uh, with a puma that I believe had a baby, which is frightening. So basically what happened was I was going to look for group D um, and as I was going there, I started, because I had worked with spider monkeys, I knew what spider monkey alarm calls sounded like. That is just like this barking, repetitive uh, vocalization, like, oh, 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 And then as I was going, I could hear the spider monkeys going crazy with this alarm bark. And then I was like, something's going on. And then as I was getting closer to group D, um, it, the alarm call wouldn't stop and it just got louder and louder and louder and louder. And then finally, when I got to the point where the spider monkeys were, they were all looking down. And my first reaction was like a spider monkey fell, fell on the ground, they're freaking out. Or usually they would do that a lot when there's peccaries, like these uh, large pigs of the forest. And then they freak out and they do the alarm call, but just a little bit, but they were like just going and going. And then I grab my binos and I try to look where I think the spider monkey fell and I see something and these spider monkeys, they're called yellow, uh, yellow bellied spider monkeys. And I saw something orangish and I thought it was like a spider monkey, like on its back. And then I look closer and I see a face of the puma with my binos. And I'm like, holy crap, what do I do? And like my heart was just racing. And also I saw like the face of the puma and then like a, like a little tail but it was like too far away to be the same individual, which is why I think, I don't know that it was a mom with, with, with a baby. And my first reaction is like, feline mom with baby, bad, 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 bad. And my first reaction was like, I need to grab a stick so I can defend myself from this puma if it tries to attack it. Of course, you're not rational at that point. Also, usually we carry uh, telemetry antennas. That day I didn't have one. First time in my life that I wanted to carry that big, annoying telemetry antenna. Anyway, try to find a solid stick in the middle of the Amazon rainforest where everything is rotting. It was impossible. And then as I was trying to find the stick, I couldn't find one. And then I tried to go and see if the puma is still there. I look with my binos and the puma is gone. And I'm just like, well, I guess I'm not following group D today. So I turned around and went to look for a different group because I was like, I, and this was like a kilometer away from the station. I'm like, I don't want to be eaten. I was by myself. And yeah, I'm like, no one's going to find me. Um, yeah. So that's, <laughs> I've always wanted to see a feline in the forest. Uh, so it was one of the most exciting moments of my entire life, I would say, but also one of the scariest moments. 
to go back to the question really quickly, my biggest fear while following uh, the monkeys is actually when there's like a windstorm, uh, because more than an animal or a snake bite or a jaguar, a puma, whatever, I think what's most likely to kill me in the field is a uh, uh, tree branch falling and knocking me on my head. Um, so when there were wind storms, like I was like kind of dodging the, the tree branches that were falling. Uh, and those, those for me, other than the Puma interaction, those were the most scariest time, the most scariest times in the field that, and you would sometimes hear like a, a, a large tree falling, like really close to you, like 20 meters away or something. And you would see like all the trees that it brought down with it. So yeah, that was always like my my scariest moments. It's when there were windstorms in the forest, but I'm I'm alive and well still. <laughs> and then besides the puma, what were the pre the predators in the this area again? So there's um there's jaguars. Um, also the the only time that I've actually seen like a close to predation interaction with the woolies was either it was a ornate hawk eagle or a harpy eagle that are these eagles that are just giant. And we were once following the, the woolies. And then again, it, everything happened very fast, but we saw like this big bird with a very wide wingspan just coming to the forest and all the woolies freaked out, freaked out. They all started doing alarm call barking. Uh, not that infants, but the juveniles that you're like, you're a little too big to be riding your mom, like large juveniles hopped on top to their moms. Uh, and the moms, you know, like they started like frantically doing this alarm call. Uh, so I would say for the woolly, for the larger adelines, uh, or for the adelines that are the largest primates uh, in the Americas, uh, I would say jaguars, pumas, and uh, these large eagles, ornate hawk eagles, or the um, uh, harpy eagles would be like some of the most likely predators. Dang, I've seen photos of harpy eagles and they are, they look like they're big enough to carry off like a human child. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, I think we will go ahead and wrap up. So I just wanna thank you um, Laura, for being here with us and giving us such an amazing presentation. Um, <clears throat> I think next step on the agenda is there's a pre-recorded session at 2.30, and then our last live session of today um, is at 3 and is with the Pacific Primate Sanctuary. So thank you all for attending. Again, thank you, Laura, for being here with us, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for the invitation. This was great. <laughs>